Thank you for having me here. I've actually had quite a bit of fun. It's nice to see people I haven't seen in a while and to meet people that I've always wanted to meet. This is, you know, it's a great to have a, an institute that's dedicated to answering these questions. There's so few places where you find so many people interested in these things. So I kind of feel like I should, um, I don't know, confess a little bit in the beginning. I, I don't know how amazing this talk is going to be. You know, my birthday is coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm going through a bit of a midlife crisis. There's some things that are bothering me in my personal life. I'm a bit of emotional turmoil. And so I guess that might color my talk in some way. And, and I guess I'm going to probably spend a lot of time complaining about what other people do in the origins. Um, but like any good academic, uh, I will follow all of that sort of bashing uh, with my own work in which I make the same mistakes, but I sort of pretend that I don't. Uh, hopefully, you don't really pick up on that and you're just impressed. Uh, and if you do, um, well, at least it's, it's entertaining. And the last thing is that, you know, I've, I've been giving sort of the same introduction for a while, sort of framing uh, the way I think about my work in one particular manner. And I was initially not planning on doing that here because I know some people have heard me uh, give this talk a couple of times. Uh, but then I changed my mind at the last minute. And that's because I realized something that I didn't realize before, uh, which I guess I should have, is that the way I think of origins and the way I think of you know, how uh, my lab approaches origins is influenced by people at ELSI. And, and I thought, you know, since I'm here, um, I really shouldn't hide that. Um, so, with that sort of rambling beginning, uh, let me start by saying the type of chemistry that we call metabolism is only a subset of all of the different types of chemical reactions that could have occurred on this planet. And so how is it that one particular subset emerged at the expense of others? Well, there is a paper that influenced my thinking on this uh, from Shelley Copley, Eric Smith, and Harold Morowitz that pointed out that if there was a catalyst on this planet, then that would have kinetically funneled reactants down specific pathways at the expense of alternate pathways. In other words, it could have pruned the type of chemistry that existed on this planet and therefore led to the types of chemistry that we call metabolism today. So what kinds of catalysts could have existed on this planet? Well, I like the proposition that Melvin Calvin made in the 1950s. Metal ions are abundant on this planet and metal ions intrinsically possess catalytic activity. And so Calvin made this example that I like which is that iron ions alone in solution can catalytically decompose hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. And then, it, and then if you take that metal center and you stick it into a porphyrin ring, that rate increases about a thousand fold. And then if you take that resulting heme and you put that in a much more highly evolved protein scaffold to get catalase, it goes up another 10 to the seventh fold. And so the point simply being that the catalysts were always there and the only thing biology did was provide better and better scaffolds to augment that intrinsic activity. So I think porphyrins and hemes are really quite fascinating. I'm a little bit surprised that uh, I haven't actually really uh, put much effort into thinking about them. I, I personally think that those are prebiotically plausible molecules aside from catalase, obviously. Um, but what we've been more interested in are in iron sulfur clusters, and that's because iron sulfur clusters have long been hypothesized to have been important in the origins of life. This planet obviously is rich in iron and sulfide. They spontaneously assemble into iron sulfur clusters, and they are found all over central metabolism. I think you would be hard-pressed to find an organism that can survive in the absence of iron and iron sulfur clusters. They seem to be important to life as we know it. And so this is just a representation of the citric acid cycle. Whether you like the citric acid cycle running in the forward or reverse direction is not particularly uh, important to me right now. We also so show the sort of smaller cycle of the glyoxylate cycle here. And the arrows that are shown in red are the steps in which iron sulfur clusters are involved. And so the point simply being, for now at least, that iron sulfur clusters are important to central metabolic processes. And some of you may actually say, well, 
you know, people have already demonstrated these things. In the last several years, there have been lots of interesting uh, cool papers in which people have shown prebiotic mechanisms to cycle through these types of metabolic reactions. And so I do think that type of work is important because it shows what type of chemistry was accessible uh, early on. But I have to admit, you know, and this is one of my criticisms now, I don't get particularly excited about it either. And so the reason uh, is, is a sort of, when I think about those types of experiments, I think to myself, but what is it that we've actually learned? Did we learn that you can make biological molecules abiotically? We've known that since the 1800s. Did we learn that you can make biological molecules prebiotically? Well, we've known that since the 1950s. I don't want to dismiss all of that work. I think it is important. It informs us as to which building blocks could have been present. And I, you know, Miller's paper, for example, sometimes gets criticized for not being very prebiotically plausible. And I always get very frustrated with that because I think if it wasn't for experiments like his, good solid experiments, uh, we probably wouldn't be having these conversations today. So to sort of further emphasize the problems that I have with this um, is if you look at things like the, a metabolic cycle that exists in biology, you know, let's say hypothetically you provide to the organism all of the amino acids and nucleotides and lipids and everything it needs to live. Is it going to immediately try to make isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA, fumarate, mount? I mean, that's not really the point, right? That's not what metabolism is. I think it's fundamentally different than just making the building blocks of life, which is important. But I don't think the point of metabolism are the metabolic intermediates. The point of metabolism must be something that has much more to do with thermodynamics than the specificities of which types of intermediate molecules are synthesized. Now, the origins of life is a huge field, and there's a big, big space from the Big Bang. I apologize to those who find this to be not a good representation of the Big Bang. Uh, from the Big Bang to the last universal common ancestor. There's no way any of us can really be an expert in all the different parts of the studies of the origins of life. Uh, I certainly am not capable of doing that. Those are all, all the contributions that people are making and all their own disciplines are very important. I actually really sincerely don't want to belittle any of them. It's part of why I love this field. I love coming to these types of meetings and learning all of these amazing things that I'm not an expert in myself. Um, but I will point out that I think, as Tony was uh, kind of mentioning in his uh, introduction today, that out of that vast space of origins research, I think there is, relatively speaking, little effort in trying to understand how those building blocks get together to make a cell, how we sort of transition from non-living molecules, let's say, to say in a sort of crude way, into living biology, the, the transition from chemistry to biology. And that's where I think metabolism really comes in. And that's what I'm trying to think about and trying uh, to address. So if you think about a cell, or a protocell, depending upon what stage you want to think about, that is a very low entropy, thermodynamically unfavorable state that somehow persists over time. And the way living things are able to pull that off is that they couple thermodynamically favorable reactions to the thermodynamically unfavorable reactions that are needed to sustain the existence of the cell. And here, I'm just so showing glycolysis, you know, the breakdown of glucose, not because I think that's necessarily prebiotically relevant. Um, I mean, maybe it is, I don't know, but that wasn't my thinking. It was just to show a really simple chemical reaction. But that's not really the full story, right? So again, an LC, the same LC researcher, I know I'm probably irritating Eric here because you know, he didn't think he was going to pop up in my talk, and now I'm dragging him, uh, dragging him in a couple of times. Um, but I really like this paper that he has in The American Scientist. And one of the comments that he makes, which he quotes 
uh, another person is that life is nothing but an electron looking for a place to rest. In other words, they're not just thermodynamically favorable reactions, it's oxidative chemistry. That's what seems to be fueling a living cell. It's sort of, you know, what, how cells get plugged into their energy source. And additionally, these thermodynamic, the energy that's released from these thermodynamically uh, favorable reactions gets stored. It gets deposited in a common currency. And those common currencies in biology typically are proton gradients, sodium gradients, and ATP. So we like to think a lot about how you can couple unfavorable with favorable reactions. We draw these little equations in first year chemistry, which is all accurate. Of course, none of that is wrong. Um, but I think one of the key, interesting, fascinating inventions of biology, it's not that you have to have one specific favorable reaction coupled to one specific unfavorable reaction. You can deposit that energy into a common currency. You're sort of moving from a barter uh, system to a more modern economy. And so it doesn't really matter what the organism eats, regardless if it needs to get an unfavorable thermodynamic process uh, to occur in order to maintain its existence, it can spend its money, let's say, in the form of protons, uh, sodium gradients, or ATP. So if you look at these common currencies, you'll see that they tend to get formed by metalloproteins. Fantastic. That's the kind of things I like. I'm interested in iron sulfur clusters. And we've got lots of iron sulfur clusters in, just as an example, the electron transport chain that is involved in the pumping of protons. And you can also note, when you look at these metabolic processes, that the protein scaffolds or the protein machinery are really quite highly complex. So nobody could rightfully say that, um, that of course, these things were around on the prebiotic Earth. It's nonsensical. <laughs> We could say the metal ions were around, but certainly not the uh, protein scaffolds. And so what these sorts of things have made people uh, propose essentially has been that since these proteins weren't around, then that chemistry must have been mediated by minerals. And so what you see here is pyrite, pyrite sorry, an iron sulfur um, containing mineral. The one that gets talked about even more is gregite, um, which essentially has, if you look at sort of its repeating unit within the mineral, you'll find that it has a core, repeating core, excuse me, that looks very, very similar to the types of four iron, four sulfur clusters that you find in biology today. I can't deny that that looks pretty cool. You see the same you know, kind of cofactor that you see in biology in a mineral. Um, the only thing I would say is just because things look similar or look alike doesn't mean that one came from the other. Biologists have known this for a long time, right? Bats and birds, just as an example, are two different organisms that can fly. In some sense, you could say they look a little bit similar, but one did not evolve from the other. And it is difficult in this field, right? We work in a difficult field. We may not actually ever figure out the answers to the questions that we're asking. Um, and we oftentimes are guided by how things look more biological-like or not. But we shouldn't accept those sorts of ideas um, uncritically and think problems are solved. And I will say that even further, because I do think minerals are important. You know, I'm going to bash them a bit today, but to be honest, I sincerely do think they're important. But I understand a lot better how they would be important for the synthesis of the building blocks of life. In fact, they must have participated in that. If they were around and they have some sort of activity, they must have engaged in the synthesis of the building blocks of life. I can't understand how that gives you metabolism, and I can't understand how you go from minerals to sort of rock-based chemistry, let's say, to what we see today in biology. In other words, we're here today to talk about catalysis or prebiotic catalysis. And so I don't really understand how minerals help us to go from catalysts to enzymes. <laughs>
Now, again, I don't have all of the answers here. I really enjoyed the talk, uh, Irena's talk right before mine, about these sort of polyester types of uh, catalysts that I think actually does have potential for uh, evolving into a system that is genetically encoded and can help answer some of these questions, particularly because they're thermodynamically uh, more favorable than a lots of the things that people look at. Um, but I don't, you know, when I think about just simple catalysis on the prebiotic earth, again, I do think it's important. I think it's important for making the building blocks for pruning the types of accessible chemistry. But do you think that a living system can just occur in an unregulated fashion through spontaneous chemistry? I mean, I understand this sort of network systems chemistry approach where you have interconnected chemical reactions that, you know, one thing changes in one part, it offsets something in another part, and the whole system is able to self-sustain. I do get all of that. In fact, it's very interesting and important for the origins. Um, but that's, that, that seems there's, there's a missing part, let's say, between that and the way that enzymes regulate what happens in biology. And so what I found fascinating, what I found interesting, is instead of thinking about minerals, which I'm just really, like... Uh, I'm just surprised at how much people show a picture of a mineral, problem solved, like, and, and people joke about this, like how could you not understand that that's how life began? Uh, and then they don't even address, you know, well, what are the transition steps uh, going from minerals to an enzyme, or how would minerals actually uh, mediate a metabolic process uh, in a protocellular system? So what I've, what sort of caught my attention is that when people were looking at how iron sulfur clusters are synthesized in biology, so inside of a cell, they found that a 2-iron, two 2-sulfur two cluster can be stabilized by glutathione. Glutathione is a naturally occurring tripeptide. So it's a glutamate, cysteine, glycine tripeptide. And so what happens is you get four different peptides, four different glutathiones, each one donating one cystinyl thiolate ligands that is able to stabilize the formation of an iron sulfur cluster in the presence, of course, of iron and inorganic sulfide. Why did I like this? Because we've known since the days of Miller that amino acids could be made prebiotically. There are lots of different mechanisms now for making small, short peptides. A tripeptide is not that bizarre of a length. I think that's pretty reasonable. And what I like even more about it is just by looking at the structure, you can already envision ways in which you can go from a pre prebiotically plausible small peptide to something that starts to look more like a modern day protein perhaps even a protein enzyme. So you can see that the amino and carboxy groups are labeled in blue and red, and you can imagine that these peptides in aqueous solution would be far apart, uh, that they wouldn't find each other, but in the presence of iron and sulfide, you would get a templated type of reaction, again, kind of like what we heard in the previous talk, that would bring these amino and carboxy groups close enough and somehow could give rise to a peptide bond. I really don't know how that would work, if there would be a ribozyme present or uh, some sort of activation chemistry, but these are actual testable things that we can do in the lab. And if you can't test your ideas, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that bodes very well for, for our field. And if you think about where that would lead you, not only would that lead you to longer polypeptides, but if you have tripeptide units, then what naturally emerges from this sort of polymerization reaction is you get a CXXC spacing. And those are the same spacings that you find for metal ions in biology over and over again, including iron sulfur clusters. And these are, you know, I'm not the first person to notice this. Margaret Dayhoff proposed more or less this idea. There's some differences because the thinking was a little bit different in the 1960s. So again, uh, she was really a pioneer. Uh, but she, she predicted that ferrodoxin emerged from a tetrapeptide. So again, it's not exactly the same as what I talk about, but and I don't want to waste too, many times, too much time on this, but if you compare um, the things that we've been working on and what she proposed, there are a lot of remarkable similarities. So if you work with such peptides, you really do get iron sulfur clusters. And I know UV, UV visible absorption spectroscopy is not the most amazing uh, technique in the world, but it is nevertheless satisfying to see that a simple I think prebiotically plausible tripeptide can start to give you uh, behavior that you see with a highly evolved modern day human protein. And I'm not gonna go through all of the data because of the time, but uh, these things are redox active. They can accept and donate electrons. 
So one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot, and I don't know if anyone else finds this interesting, to be honest. Uh, I initially, when I first made this talk, I had like 10 slides on this. And I was thinking even last night when I was talking to Robert, um, because we should probably even talk about this more afterwards. But then, and I, and I pulled them out, not to hide them from you, Robert, but because the more I thought about it, the more I thought I'm just going to bore everybody here. But we'll, I'm happy to show you this stuff uh, this evening. But I, one of the things I've been always kind of curious about is which one of these can be considered more ancient? Which was the sort of original catalyst? Was it a mononuclear center, a 2 iron 2 sulfur, 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster, the type of clusters that you find in biology today? And so we started thinking about how these things form with tripeptides. And, and so people have been talking about the synthesis of 4 iron 4 sulfur clusters for a long time. There's a lot of, lots of beautiful work from Dick Holmes' lab at Harvard. And one of the main uh, ideas for how 4 iron 4 sulfur clusters form has been referred to as a reductive coupling. So you have two different 2 iron 2 sulfur clusters that essentially condense into a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster. And so I just have sort of a few slides on uh, the parameter space that one has to deal with when you try to think about how these things come together um, and what we think is going on. So if you think about the redox state of all of these different irons, iron centers and 2 iron 2 sulfur and 4 iron 4 sulfur clusters, you can kind of deduce without even doing the experiments uh, how these transitions probably occur. So a fully oxidized uh, cluster in which all of the iron centers are in the ferric F, Fe3 plus state, uh, that can stabilize a 2 iron 2 sulfur cluster, but not a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster. Those just do not typically form, so you would not imagine that you would get a coupling of two fully oxidized 2 iron 2 sulfur clusters and the synthesis of a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster. The fully reduced on the other side does not typically form for 2 iron 2 sulfur or 4 iron 4 sulfur clusters. And so just by these sort of simple analyses on paper, you can start figuring out that the most likely uh, transition would be from the sort of mixed valence, uh, one reduced iron, one oxidized iron, and a 2 iron 2 sulfur cluster it gives you the same ratio of ferric and ferrous ions in the 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster that is formed. And you may ask yourself, well, on the prebiotic earth, there was no oxygen, so where did those oxidized iron uh, ions come from? Uh, well, what's been known for a while, and, and we also uh, repeated and showed, uh, is that, in fact, UV light can photooxidize iron. So this would be a type of chemistry that would occur more on the surface of the planet rather than being uh, deeply submerged away from sunlight. But the presence of ferric ions, I don't think, um, is that strange. So one of the things that always confused us uh, from our experiments in the lab is we can control the type of iron sulfur cluster that forms through the amount of inorganic sulfide that we add. So the transition from a mononuclear to a 2 iron 2 sulfur cluster is not that strange because there's no bridging inorganic sulfides in a mononuclear center. But the transition from a 2 iron 2 sulfur to 4 iron 4 sulfur never really made sense to us because the ratios of the bridger, bridging inorganic sulfides uh, and the iron ions are the same for both of them. So why is it that when we increase the sulfide concentration, we get uh, preferentially the formation of a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster? So, you know, I'm talking a lot, and I'm just sort of showing you cartoonish figures. I do want to say we really do have data. Uh, this is just UV visible and paramagnetic and MR spectra, but we also collected Mossbauer spectra on everything, EPR spectra on everything, and cyclic voltometry uh, data on everything. So I'm not putting this all uh, in there, but when I talk about the species that we have present, we're using a variety of techniques to make sure that that is, in fact, what we have in solution. So we sort of mapped out step by step, uh, based on our data, possibilities of what could be happening. And so when we mix uh, iron chloride and uh, sodium sulfide in aqueous solution, the things that we form right away are a 2 iron 2 sulfur cluster that you can see. Uh, shown in panel, or I don't know if you call it panel, but mala cluster A, let's say. Uh, and that's not surprising. Based on Robert's work, 2 iron 2 sulfur clusters do form more easily than 4 iron 4 sulfur clusters. Uh, we do also get a mononuclear center. And so we're starting with ferric iron, iron 3 plus, but what happens is that the mononuclear center gets reduced almost instantaneously. And so when you move to B, you have a two, uh, two ferric ions and the 2 iron 2 sulfur cluster and immediately you have this appearance of the reduced iron in the mononuclear center. And what's interesting is that the ligand exchange rates are really fast. And so what seems to be happening 
is we get the iron ions that are popping in and out of the two iron, two sulfur cluster and exchanging with the mononuclear sensor. And so what that means is that the reductions are likely happening at the mononuclear sensor. And so when we see the appearance over time of the reduced two iron, two sulfur cluster, that is just the incorporation of the iron from the mononuclear sensor. And if that happens again, as you would see in E, in which the second ion gets uh, substituted, then everything would fall apart because the fully reduced cluster is not stable. And I had mentioned uh, that earlier. You could also imagine that you would get reductive coupling at the step from D to G. That would be sort of the traditional mechanism. But there is another pathway that could occur too. And that other pathway would essentially be from B to H, in which you have a diferic iron sulfur cluster and two different mononuclear centers that then condense to give a four iron, four sulfur cluster. And the reason why we started to think that perhaps that's what's happening is that is the only mechanism based on all the things that we see in solution that would be dependent upon the addition of additional inorganic sulfide. So I'm sure that's not super clear, and I apologize if it's not. Um, we can talk about it afterwards if anybody is interested. Um, but I didn't want to dwell on this for too long. So which is more stable? Um, you know, again, we don't have perfect data on this, but I will say that it does seem that as long as you have enough sulfide present, that things do tend to end up in a four iron, four sulfur cluster. The importance of that two iron, two sulfur cluster forming right away is that you're capturing some of the ferric ions that otherwise would be reduced. And the ligand exchange kinetics decrease going from mononuclear to two iron, two sulfur to four iron, four sulfur cluster. And this is something that we're working on more now. Um, but I do think all indications seem to point out that the four iron, four sulfur cluster is more stable. So uh, I just want to point out that we have looked at the photochemistry of these systems and you don't have to add inorganic sulfide. So in collaboration with John Sutherland and uh, the student at the time, Claudia Bonfio, what she did is she just looked, if you take a mononuclear center, you shine UV light on it, and then turn the UV light off and analyze what you have, you get the formation of a polynuclear iron sulfur cluster. So a two iron, two sulfur cluster, we can see this formation by Mossbauer spectroscopy. And if you keep the light on long enough, eventually you even get a four iron, four sulfur cluster. And so what's happening here uh, is that we are fertilizing uh, the cystinal residues. So you can see the loss of the methylene resonances of the cysteine um, amino acid and the peptide and the appearance of methyl resonances of an alanine over time. And so we're essentially cannibalizing some of our ligands. So here it's drawn that the, those that are not coordinated uh, to the iron center are losing. They're breaking the carbon sulfur bonds uh, with UV light. And those uh, sulfur atoms from the thiolate side chain become the bridging inorganic sulfides. And so one criticism that people like Sean always like to tell me is, well, UV light will then destroy all of your peptides and you'll have nothing to bind the metal centers. And it does actually seem that if you have metal ions bound to the cysteine, that it does protect them. So the ones that get destroyed are those that are not coordinated to the metal center. And if we add metal ions like magnesium that do not coordinate to uh, the thiolate ligands, uh, that does not afford any protection. We also see stabilization to desulfurization from temperature. So high temperatures can also lead to the loss of sulfur centers. And uh, that can be also protected by seawater that has a lot of metal ions in them. So even if I don't work on hydrothermal vents and it's not my favorite theory, I sincerely do try to go wherever our data takes us. Uh, this would indicate that peptides could survive uh, this environment. The protection afforded by uh, seawater is not as good uh, to UV as we saw for protection to, uh, to heat. So everything that we did, we also repeated in vesicles. And uh, the reason why we did that is we wanted to see if we can start getting something that looks more biological-like. Can we get the formation of a proton gradient, for example? And so I would just say that our iron sulfur clusters can accept electrons from NADH. And if you want to then reoxidize your iron sulfur cluster, you can do that with hydrogen peroxide, which will release hydroxide ions. And if you put all of that chemistry inside of a vesicle, 
you do get the generation of a proton gradient. In other words, we can put together a really simple prebiotic-like electron transfer pathway. And so one of the things we're working on now is trying to couple this to the types of chemistries that people say are prebiotic metabolism to see if we can actually uh, capture some of those electrons from the oxidative chemistry to give rise to a proton gradient. And I just have two more slides, so don't worry. I'm not going to speak for another half an hour. Uh, I just wanted to point out that we do have a collaboration with Ram Krishna Murthy on looking at uh, different types of membranes and vesicles uh, that can form with prebiotically plausible molecules. And I won't go into it. You can check out the paper. Uh, but we have found that cyclophospholipids can give uh, vesicles that are quite stable to pH and to metal ions. And we're interested in these things for the types of reasons uh, that I've been talking about. And so this is my last slide. And so I bashed everybody for not actually uh, looking at the transition from chemistry to biology. And so you could rightfully say, did we actually do it? Did we actually try to address this problem? Well, we tried, um, but I don't think we have. And the reason why is I don't think any of this matters unless it gives a selective advantage to a protocellular system. And we haven't done, demonstrated that yet, but that's where we would like to go with this. So I'm sorry for running you know, a minute or so over time. Uh, these are the people that have helped in this work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Again, let's open up the floor to questions. <laughs> the stress involved in asking a question. Um, wonderful talk. Um, thank you. You focus primarily on the activation of these reactions by UV radiation. Mm -hmm. And so my question is generally about whether or not you've looked at other forms of energy, like alpha, beta, gamma radiation. And the main reason I ask that is you touched beautifully on the aspects of preservation of this and sustaining these reactions. Um, as soon as you move into a subsurface environment, you would not get the UV, but you would have the alpha, beta, gamma. And you would also have a subsurface environment in which these kinds of reactions could indeed be sustained. So I'm not necessarily talking about hydrothermal vents. I'm talking yeah. more about, as a Canadian, you'll be with me on this, <laughs> um, continental systems in which you actually have a lower temperature regimes. And so that would translate then to thinking about questions of origin of life in different kinds of settings on this planet, but would also be, I think, the critical part that would allow us to then translate that to thinking about how this might apply, for instance, on the ocean worlds, yeah, yeah. Europa, Enceladus, et cetera. But it would be around looking at different kinds of energy. Has that been done yet? I've never seen anything like that. We've not tried to do anything like that. Um, I think that's a great idea. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it if you're interested. Um, you know, I, I do think that at the end of the day, the more we learn, there's going to be a variety of environments that were important for synth synthesizing a variety of the systems that we need uh, to give a protocellular system. Um, I don't know what the right answer is, and probably it's a mixture of different ones, but it makes sense. Yeah, I think the radiogenic chemistry aspect of things is really opening up some new perspectives, particularly as we move them from Earth to other worlds. Yeah, that's a very good point. Fantastic talk. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay, any other questions? I provoked you, didn't I? Wonderful. It, it was absolutely delightful. Um, I, I share so many of your senses of what's satisfying and unsatisfying. <laughs> um, I want to ask a question about so many directions you could go, so maybe I'll start with that. I'm thinking about making a comment, but if my question is too long, maybe I'll save it for later. Okay. Um, one of my questions overlapped with one of those that's up there, impurity ions. You've worked out a system for understanding what happens in iron and sulfur where you have few degrees of freedom and you can control. And now that that system is in place, it gives you a disciplined way to look at what might change if there are impurity ions. And I was just interested if you think that that's in the cards anytime soon. And related to that, the thing that seems so much in need of explanation and for which the way you're looking at this seems like it could be so helpful is the understanding of cofactor biosynthesis, and particularly redox cofactor biosynthesis. Right now, you're taking your organosynthesis as a sort of a boundary condition and studying what happens with the metals and the sulfides. But of course, the organosynthesis is going to be happening in a system 
at the same time as the one you're studying, if that became one of the active variables in your analysis, could you make some headway in, and not only cofactor biosynthesis, but the problem of how folding becomes possible as an organized dynamic in a relatively simple condensing environment? Do you think you could start to contribute some organizing principles for either cofactor biosynthesis or what makes folding an orderly or solvable problem with the things you've already done? Okay. Thank you for those excellent questions. Uh, the first one with uh, impurities in metal ions is, is actually a question I sort of feared in the beginning uh, because zinc will always win. If you add zinc uh, to anything that binds iron, zinc will displace uh, the iron. Um, but if you look at the concentrations and what people think were the concentrations on the prebiotic planet, uh, which unfortunately I cannot remember right now, uh, it looks like there would have been enough iron to survive and to win. We haven't looked very carefully at this, but we have played around with adding zinc to see if they will destroy our clusters. And part of the stuff that I didn't show is that what comes out of those experiments informed a little bit on that mechanism pathway that I was drawing out. Um, in terms of how that would impact folding or cofactor biosynthesis, uh, so we tried to get this sort of polymerization reaction to get a sort of more folding mechanism, and we haven't succeeded yet. In fact, we've been trying for quite some time, but we're going to start some collaborations with others that perhaps uh, can give us some skills that we don't possess to, to better tackle that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, yes, that's important, and yes, we would like to do it. Um, you know, at the end, there are probably multiple systems that need to overlap, and it's easy to present things as sort of discrete units, and they're probably not very accurate, but I don't... I haven't thought of a good way of doing those types of experiments yet, but if people have suggestions, I'm happy to consider. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time today. Um, there's some interesting questions on the board, so while you're at lunch or during the breaks, please keep these in. Oh, please don't leave yet. Please don't leave yet. Well. <laughs> Anyway, so, you know, please keep these in the back of your heads and please discuss during the meetings. And uh, yeah, let's give uh, Sheriff another round of applause. <laughs>